Hi, Audra. Thanks so much for that great introduction. And hi, everybody on the webcast uh, today. Um, Audra mentioned that there are folks from around the world, so I'm, I'm thrilled to um, I'm thrilled that you guys decided to join. So thanks for that. Uh, so as, uh, as Audra mentioned, I'm going to be speaking today about the secrets of the user experience team of one. Um, just to give you a bit of a sense of me, uh, who's, who's talking to you, this is a picture of me in one of my project team rooms, which is one of my most favorite places to work, and um, I'm enjoying lunch there. Um, but uh, so yeah, I live, in, I live in California, and I've been doing uh, digital product design for about 15 years, uh, and as, as Audra um, shared with you, I, I didn't start out as a user experience designer. I started out doing front-end development, actually. And over time, gradually found that the work I was doing kind of was more in the realm of user experience. Uh, I did lots of jobs where I was in companies where nobody knew what user experience was or cared much about it. Um, and then I went into a user experience consulting firm and was all of a sudden surrounded by all of these user experience professionals um, and in awe of the skills that they had. And what I started to see was that um, you get a lot of support when you have uh, fellow user experience uh, professionals to work with, and you, it helps you do better work. Um, but that many of the things that a, a robust UX team can bring, you can kind of get even in a team of one environment if you know how to enlist the help of your non-user experience colleagues. Um, and that was the inspiration for a book, actually, that I wrote with Rosenfeld Media, um, which is uh, called The User Experience Team of One. And that's bas the basis of, of a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm going to go into a lot of specific kind of lessons and, and sort of methods that uh, I think can be optimized for a user experience teams of, team of one's situation. And um, those methods are uh, informed by some of my experiences in consulting and informed by some of my experiences as a team of one, and also informed by you know, conversations I've had with lots of other folks in the field. Um, and if you're interested in learning any more about them, of course, they're still deeper in the book. Um, but to start, I, I kind of I, I was hoping to structure this session today as sort of sharing my journey. Um, so I hope I hope that will be relevant and interesting to folks. Um, so when I started doing work, I you know I started as a front end developer, and, and little by little I started doing more kind of UI design work. But this is what UX was to me. It was sort of sitting in front of a computer and pushing pixels around in Visio or you know, Illustrator or Photoshop, and um, the more I did that and the, the more skilled I became at that, I started to realize that doing UI design work actually had deeper um, implications for an organization. So I start doing this, you design a UI, and little by little what you're doing is you're, you're convincing an organization that it can change how it works. You're convincing them that um, user-centered thinking uh, is creates uh, better products that actually make customers and users happy and that also potentially can help an organization um, be more successful in its business goals. And so that, that trajectory of like coming into user experience um, <laughs> through, through the UI but then discovering that you have uh, potentially a lot of impact to an organization or th there is the potential to impact an organization is an interesting um, – sort of uh, tension, an interesting balance. And for, for me personally, what I found in my own journey was that it made me feel nervous <laughs> a lot of the time. I felt like, oh, I, I just, I'm just pushing pixels around here. Um, do I have the, the credibility and the skills to actually help our entire organization start to think in a more user-centered way? Uh, which this feeling can be summed up as um, a, a term called imposter syndrome, which you may be familiar with this idea that you, whatever you, it is that you're doing your job, you're kind of an imposter at it. And there's a great quote from the comedian Tina Fey about imposter syndrome, which you can see on screen, just that it's, you vacillate between this sort of extreme egomania where you're thinking, yes, I can do this. I know what this organization needs. What it needs is to change the way it thinks about product design and development. And then that other feeling of, oh my God, I'm a fraud. They're onto me. They're going to figure me out. And, uh, and that, that nervousness, uh, is it's a challenge in the work, and so for me, when I realized that uh, that this tension is okay, that it's natural, and that it shouldn't stop you from trying to have an impact on your organization, that that was a very um, 
that was a very exciting realization for me. And so what I'd love to share, I guess, with the time that we have left is um, some of the important kind of aha moments for me in my, my journey on the, on the road to getting more confident uh, in helping, um, helping my organization with that broader mindset shift. So to start out, at the very beginning, I think I, I was just full of lots of ambition and enthusiasm for making better um, user experiences that really helped people be liberated by technology and not frustrated by technology. And I had lots of ambition and, and perhaps not a lot of wisdom under my belt. But in some of my UX team of one positions, I started to see some interesting ways of working that seemed to have good impact in, in how the organization thought about user-centered design. In one of my UX teams of one job, um, I, 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 w I got invited basically into the planning work sessions for a, a big product that we were working on. And um, so it was me and business analysts and the product owner, and we were all kind of um, strategizing at the very beginning about, okay, what's most important in this product? How are we, we going to ensure that the user experience is really high quality? And I facilitated a few little activities that were helping us kind of identify what, what, what is most important to get right in this product. And um, that, was, um, a very, that was my first taste of sort of how valuable it is to, to participate, not just at the level of designing screens, but also in discussing kind of what it is at a higher level that we're trying to achieve. So that was, that was a great kind of first experience as a UX team of one. And then when I joined um, the consultancy, Adaptive Path, I, I saw additional practices that they were doing that really seemed to, to build on this, this basic idea that you can get more involved and you can do better work. Um, one thing that I saw at Adaptive Path was they had dedicated team rooms for products or projects where all the um, the design artifacts and all the work in progress are on the wall, and the team meets there every day to to sort of advance the work. And that was a really um, valuable way to get people to kind of engage really deeply with the user-centered design process. There I also saw that inviting all of the clients on a project into these interactive working sessions, these really hands-on workshops, was a way to get everybody really invested in the user-centered design process. Um, I also saw that using um, techniques like design critiques where you invite a broad group of people in to just examine the design work and process and evaluate if it's, you know, how it can be made better was a really powerful way to get people involved in the process. And then even at Adaptive Path there was a notion uh, that we used called open design sessions where if you have a kind of tough problem that you're working on, you just invite everybody to come and brainstorm solutions together, which is such an obvious idea, but it also... Um, was just a very powerful way of getting new minds onto a problem. So all of these little observations, these little um, experiences that I had in specific project contexts that seemed um, really uh, effective led me to an important sort of preliminary first, first realization, which was the user experience process requires you to invite people in. Uh, if you're a UX team of one, it's so tempting to kind of put on your your headphones and get behind that computer and just spend time kind of loving up, uh, you know, a, a comp or a wireframe until it's as done as you can make it. But that that is maybe not the most um, successful way to, to facilitate that process. So this inviting people in seemed like a really fundamental thing that I felt like I had to learn kind of the hard way um, when I first got into user uh, user-centered design and user experience. So I'd love to share a couple of methods that I think user experience teams of one can use for inviting people in. Um, the first one is kind of an interesting one. It's, it's a project brief. And a project brief may actually traditionally be owned by other disciplines like program management or product management. But if they're not doing it, this is, I think, something that's very appropriate for users experience teams of one to offer to their organizations. So this is basically just um, a really simple document that you create that helps you address this question of what are the outcomes that we're trying to create for this particular design project or for this product. Um, here is an example of a uh, project brief. Um, so super simple. It just kind of gives a high-level overview of why we're doing this thing. Um, it may give some specific information about some of the core requirements at a very high level for this product that we're working on. And then from a UX perspective, you can even get a little bit um, into the sort of details of what the experience really should feel like or what it, what it ought to be about. Um, here on this particular 
uh, brief were showing design principles, which are one way of kind of explaining what the personality of the experience should be. But you could also show, you know, a storyboard or just some really high-level thing that helps people kind of activate the, the sort of imagining and empathy part of their brain to think about the user experience they're trying to create. So Project Brief is a really cool um, kind of technique for UX teams of one because just the process of creating this thing and then sharing it and sort of working it with your team uh, it fosters a, a deeper conversation about what kind of experience you're trying to create for people and what are the most important aspects of that. Um, but an activity you can do with the project brief that's even more interesting is what I call a project brief redlining activity. And the idea there is that you, you you create a project brief, but you just treat it as kind of a first draft. And then you can even print it out kind of big, like a poster sized. And then you set up a work session with your team where you um, the goal is just to edit it, to make it better. And so we give everyone a nice big fat red pen and you say, okay, let's mock, let's you know hack this up, let's make it better. And so the, you're sort of inviting a cross-functional team of you know pro product managers or engineers or QA folks or just you know content writers or sales folks, whoever whoever works with you, to help you you create a shared picture of what it is you're trying to accomplish together. That can be a really powerful coming together experience. So uh, if you're interested in doing a project brief, it's pretty simple. You figure out what are the kind of core building blocks that you want to document with your team. You kind of create a first draft, and then ideally you share that as a kind of this facilitated discussion with the team. Uh, another method that you can use, which can be super simple but really uh, powerful, is to do an opportunity workshop. And the goal of an opportunity workshop is, again, very focused on bringing people in. Um, it's just about identifying what are the kind of primary areas of the product that really need the most work. And, and then also, what are the areas of the product or the experience that are great that we shouldn't screw up? So the way that you would do this is you get people together and you can even kind of print out uh, kind of screens or sort of touch points of the product and kind of put them all up on the wall, give everyone a chance to look through them and write down notes about things that are good or things that are bad. And then you, know, you ask people to brainstorm, okay, what are some of the weaknesses that you're seeing in our product right now? Or, or, and alter, also, what are the strengths that you're seeing in our product right now? And then you facilitate a discussion around what are the big themes that are popping out there. And that can be a really good way to just to start to, um, to develop a bit of focus for some of the top priorities uh, in, in improving an existing user experience if, if you have that. So as a, just a kind of high-level summary with the Opportunity Workshop, you schedule a work session. You get some muffins and coffee, and, or you, if, if that's your, your way, invite people in and, um, and then guide them in a discussion of the strengths and weaknesses of the product and prioritize and discuss further kind of what you're going to do with what you've learned. Another technique that you can use, which seems like a kind of personal technique, but it actually is, I think, very helpful for getting you to seek out partners and answers to questions within your organization is a UX questionnaire. Uh, so the idea of a UX questionnaire is it's just you take some time to ask yourself some really fundamental questions about the experience that you're trying to provide to your customers. The, um, th there's a kind of an example template, which is totally uh, uh, just sort of for illustrative purposes. I think you could ask different questions of yourself based on the type of organization that you're in. But let's say some foundational and sort of straightforward questions you might ask are, number one, who even works on our product internally? Who are the people in my own organization who I probably need to get to know better? Uh, and just taking the time to kind of list that stuff out and to ask, okay, who's on the periphery who's going to have an impact on our product experience as well, but who may not be directly involved every day? Um, that can be uh, itself a very illuminating activity. Uh, then take a little bit of time to think, okay, what is it that we've stated as our strategy for this, this product? What, are we, what's, what makes us unique in the market? What are the core you know, sort of building blocks of our experience that are meaningful to our customers? Do they have any significant relationship to how we brand ourselves? Just can you summarize for yourself why your product <laughs> is special and why your customers want to use it? If there's no answer to that, that could be an interesting foundation itself for a conversation with your team. Um, and then even if you, if, you, if you are this far along, taking some time to let yourself think through, okay, what are some of the core scenarios or tasks that this product has? It's very common for teams to want to start with tasks and scenarios and to forget thinking about things like strategy or kind of product vision. And 
I'd say letting yourself actually take the time to explicitly sort of get that out of your head, these are the tasks and scenarios, and then move beyond that can actually be very un... It can help the team understand that there's user experience design and, and user-centered design is, is about more than just UI workflows. Uh, there's also, um, I think, a lot of value in taking time to say, how much do we know about our actual users' goals in using this product? What are the assumptions that we're making about our customers, our users, and to what extent have we validated those assumptions? And then finally, um, specifically, like what, how will we know <laughs> that we're successful with what we're doing? What, what, what numbers will move? Will it be revenue? Will it be active users? Will it be unique visits? Um, and if there's no answer to that, that's okay. There's no answer. But then that is what makes this tool a very valuable tool for bringing people into the process because it forces you to go out and find those answers by talking to people in your organization. So the, that's uh, the UX questionnaire. One last technique, uh, and, and, and again, it's a simple process, right? You just ask yourself some key questions, and where you have uh, uh, no answers, <laughs> that's where you go reach out to the people that you work with. The, um, there's another technique called the UX health check, which is actually, it was created first by a team of user experience professionals at Comcast, uh, Livia Labache and Austin Govella. And it's, it's a cool technique because it's really low effort, but it helps the team, a cross-functional team, begin to think about um, how to measure kind of improvements in user experience over time. The basic idea is that you just start by saying, okay, these are the parts of our product. This is, you know, let's just break it down into meaningful chunks, like the profile section, the, the sort of the commerce section, whatever, whatever is appropriate for your product. And then for each section, you say, okay, um, who, should, who do we want to be as good as in an ideal world? You know, do, should, our, should our wall be as good as Facebook's wall? Should our cart be as good as Amazon's cart? You just set an aspirational goal of who you think is, you know, is the, the best in class example. And then for each of those benchmarks, you say, okay, well, maybe we don't have to be 100% as good as Facebook's wall, but 50% but as good would probably be nice. Uh, and so you kind of say, like, how, how great do we really need to be for each of these things? And then you have a discussion with the, your cross-functional team. Okay, we know how great we want to be, but how great are we? And, and this is the most important part of this as a technique, this discussion piece, because it's really just a, a way of um, having an, a uh, kind of straightforward conversation about where there's the need for, for most improvement in the product. So you document that conversation too, because that's important. And then you repeat this process kind of regularly, um, monthly or quarterly, so that you can track your progress over time. Okay, we, we said that the um, uh, kind of the last item was the most the most terrible, so we spent a month fixing it. What did it do? Um, this, if it's if it bears. Um, saying explicitly, although it's probably clear, is not a scientific method. It, it looks pseudoscientific because it's in Excel and because there are numbers and colored highlighted cells, but that's, its its goal is not to be science, rigorously scientific. Its goal is to be a framework for talking to the team on a re regular basis about the quality of the user experience and having a discussion, a shared discussion, a candid shared discussion about what's bad and what could get better is the real point of it. So if you want to do a UX health check, um, first step is to pull together that cross-functional team that is, involves you know, the, all the folks who work on your products. And then figure out what sections you want to be tracking. Pick your competitive benchmarks and how good you think you ought to be relative to them. Then rate and uh, start working on the things that you see need to be improved. And then most importantly, repeat regularly. So all of these these methods, these four methods that we've just been looking at are, are really, I think, in some ways good examples of really sort of almost kind of tactical hands-on little tools that actually help you facilitate more strategic, broader conversations by bringing people into your process. Um, so that, that's a, those are good, good things to start out with if that's, if that's something that you're trying to accomplish. Um, so Further in my journey, after after thinking about how to bring people into the process, I started to um, to pay attention to some other aspects of the user experience design work. Um, in in my my roles as teams of one, some things that I started to see were working successfully for me were um, 
number one, I was on a project once actually where the we did some wireframes, and then the my manager, who wasn't a user user experience professional, he was kind of more of a project manager, but he was great. He said, "Could you go back and just re-sketch those things on a big poster with like a marker? I know they exist as wireframes, but I think it would help everybody to kind of just talk about the concept rather than the." you know, the design if you, you had these big kind of sketchy looking things. And so we created, you know, there were sort of three different potential UI directions, and then we created uh, three different sort of big sketchy posters that showed those directions. And once we had them up, he said, ah, oh, this is so cool. It looks like an agency did this. This is fantastic. And um, it was funny. It seemed like a little bit of just theater to me, but it actually had this really valuable um, benefit, which was it got people talking about the design at a conceptual level and not at a kind of um, kind of UI level, and that was that was good. That was appropriate for where we were in that process. So the idea of these sort of sketchy posters was was a was a, an interesting kind of learning for me on one of my gigs as a U, as a UX team of one. Um, I also started to find in some of my organizations that I was getting invited into the requirements gathering process as a kind of just early early sketcher. So it wasn't like I was being invited to facilitate requirements gathering, but it was sort of more like um, I was there to be the scribe at the whiteboard, like uh, you know, do a quick sketch of what this could look like from a kind of UI perspective. And that was really great, actually, because it meant that I um, – was invited to participate in those early stage discussions about the user experience and had more of an opportunity to then influence the requirements. Um, and then there were a few situations where I was sort of working in an iterative, kind of sprinty fashion, uh, and that uh, where you, you quickly do a really low fidelity mock-up and then you kind of test it back with a team and then you learn from there and you go from there. Those were all really new and eye-opening ways of working for me as a, as a UX team of one. And then when I when I went into consulting and I saw it at Adaptive Path, just the heavy and sort of formal use of sketching as a discrete and important phase of the design process, prior to actual high fidelity design work, um, that was that just reinforced I think the importance of some of these earlier lessons. And then at Adaptive Path, we used a technique called sketchboards, which I'll I'll share a little bit about in a minute. That was also really interesting and eye-opening. So all these little like observations collectively led me to this so next ob next kind of realization, which was the importance of making things together as a as a user experience practice, um, making things with your hands, <laughs> making things physical and tangible, and then facilitating a process where people can really stand up against stand at a wall and look at these things in detail and, and give give feedback in a sort of energetic energetic, interactive, participatory way. Those were really important things. So some methods for making things together for a UX team of one. I mean, it, sketching, of course, is a, a big emphasis of what I've been talking about. And if you have been reading anything in you know, the UI, uh, UX rather, um, blogs and um, and discussion forums in, in at any time in the last decade, probably you'll know that sketching is important because that's a very uh, popular topic in our field. But just some specific uh, aspects of how um, I think sketching can be effective for a UX team of one. Uh, first of all, I think it's really helpful to have a kit <laughs> that you carry around with you where you really have your pens kind of at the ready. Um, I When I first started trying to improve my own skills as a sketcher, I think I had this idea that you should just be really a great sketcher if you have you know nothing but a whiteboard and a whiteboard marker or a crappy old ballpoint pen and a napkin. And that's I think a bit unrealistic. I actually think great sketchers use great tools. And um, so these are some tools that are, are, I use a lot. Uh, a fine tip black marker uh, or Sharpie is really great for kind of roughing in um, a, a basic sketch. A fatter tip marker is great for kind of creating a definition around the sketch. The warm gray chisel tip marker, which you see on the left, is um, just really great for creating shadows and foreground and background. Fine red tip, uh, fine tip red marker is good for kind of calling attention to some things. And then this non-photo blue pencil is a is a cool tool for actually sketching out. Um, like let's say you need to sketch a, a, a you know a person sitting in front of their computer and you're a little unconfident in your ability to sketch that. If you use this blue pencil to sketch the basic shapes and then go back over in a black line, and if you were to scan or take a picture of that, the blue uh, doesn't appear. So it's kind of like a way of doing a first draft of a sketch. Um, but the key, more important than any of those tools, is if you have this little toolkit with you, when you go into meetings with your teams and you're talking about you know, what could be and you're spending a lot of time using words to describe experiences, if you have the pens, you have the power. You have the ability to pull your kit out and start to kind of sketch it out and make it real for people. And what I've seen time and time again is that once you start sketching and making it concrete, number one, you 
you get a bit of control in the conversation in a way that actually helps you to um, cut through a lot of this, the verbal spinning. And number two, you all start to develop a shared picture of the same thing that you're talking about. Or you have more tangible sort of visual artifacts to then have more tangible conversations about. So it's a really, I think, important thing to be ready to do at a moment's notice as a UX team of one. Uh, and then within the actual sketching process itself, I think there's a lot of value in taking time to do what I would term generative sketching or exploratory sketching. So what that means is before you fall in love with any one particular idea, commit to um, spend some time sketching out a variety of different possibilities. This is a little template. We use the adaptive path that we call the six up template. And it's just six little thumbnail size boxes. And whenever you're working on um, a kind of an idea for any particular moment in a user experience, you sketch out six different ways you could do that same moment, that same experience. Um, this particular sketch is six different ideas for uh, kind of onboarding someone into a process. So um, that 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 process of just taking a little bit of extra time to, to sketch beyond your first idea is so powerful because what you find when you do it is your first one or two ideas come really fast and they're often heavily influenced by products you use every day or things that are already going on in the product or patterns that are really common. But then when you keep forcing yourself to push through and sketch other ways you could solve the same problem, that's when really new and kind of interesting and innovative ideas come. And it's very common that by about the third or fourth sketch, all of a sudden it gets really interesting. So that generative sketching approach is really valuable. And then going into higher level fidelity, but still just you know, with pen on paper, this is a way of really speeding up the UX process. So a detailed UI sketch that has just some annotations can often be enough documentation to give you know, to your engineering partner, uh, particularly if you're co-located, uh, for them to just kind of run with it. And it, it really eliminates the need for a kind of heavy, heavy documentation, which I think for UX teams of one is can be an important thing because you, you don't have a lot of time and there's just one of you. Uh, also, uh, the importance of, I think, more storyboard level sketching is very important as a way of helping get shared vision on what the overall experience is that you're trying to create before you go too deep into what any moment of that experience looks like at an execution level. And even just thinking about overall sort of task flows and, and how kind of one, one moment of the experience kind of bleeds into another, uh, that is often very well done at the sketching level. Um, if you just take the time to actually sketch out these are the different phases of the experience, these are the different things that a person is going to go through, and then ask yourself, okay, can someone, are there any back doors? <laughs> Could somebody jump into the middle of the experience? Could somebody accidentally fall out between step one and step two? Could somebody accidentally get to step two never having seen step one? This is a really good way of thinking through, I think, what is actually the, the reality of user experience, which is that you know we we all have really fascinating, weird ways of tricking our products. And it's often those moments in between or you know those outside cases that create the funkiest user experiences. So sketching as a kind of technique for thinking through that can be very powerful. And then, of course, sketching is a way to bring people into the process. So leading back to our, our first secret. Uh, so once you've got sketches, then, then you can facilitate that broader conversation. So if you want to sketch, get good pens. But I'd say cheap paper, <laughs> because good paper makes you afraid to put any marks on paper. Uh, and the goal is to just let the ideas flow fast and cheap. Um, give yourself a little time, sketch some ideas, but then make sure that you're taking time to actually be generative and sketch alternatives. And then invite your cross-functional team to actually engage with those sketches and do their own sketches and you know, kind of mix and match and combine. And then, uh, and then you know, go deeper, go into higher fidelity on the best ideas to come out of all that. Another technique, which I mentioned, the sketchboards, which is kind of a, it builds on sketching, um, is is a way of actually kind of combining a lot of those concepts together into one sort of big picture artifact that the team can can use as a kind of shared touch point. So the idea here is to create a picture of the overall flow of the experience, and at the same time see within that flow what are the different possibilities at each point in the process for how you could design that experience. So the basic idea of a sketchboard is you get a really big piece of paper, like from a roll of craft paper. This is the craft paper roll that we used at Adaptive Path, and you can see um, some on the wall over there on the left. And then you have a kind of, you know, some supplies, some pens, some stickies and stuff like that. And the thing that you do, the first thing you do with the big roll of paper is, you, you know, you put your big piece of paper on the wall, and then you start posting up the sketches that you've done um, 
in sort of in, presumably in the previous step. So any sketches that you've done of different ways you could solve a certain point of the user experience. And what you want to do actually is structure the the, um, the sketch board so that it's it's kind of linear and that you're looking at like okay here's part one of the experience, part two, part three, um, and just as a note, that could be really high level. That could be encompassing the entire, you know, kind of product, or it could be really micro. It could be en encompassing, you know, one one page that is really dynamic and maybe has a a kind of a state that you see when you first get there and no data has been added, and then has a state that you see when somebody is starting to put in some details, and has a state when you see when it gets like really, you know, kind of completely packed. So think about that. You could use this at multiple sort of levels, but then for each kind of part of the experience that you're trying to um, design on this sketchboard, you post up all the different explorations for that part um, for each part of the experience, kind of underneath. So. In terms of left to right, it ends up being a, a view of the breadth of the system. And then from top to bottom, it ends up being a view of all the different explorations for each moment in that experience. And then the important thing about this is that not that you create it, but that you use it with your team. So you take it off the wall, uh, and then you um, take it somewhere <laughs> where your team is, and then you have a conversation around it. You basically look at the sketches, you explain what you're thinking there, and then you annotate heavily when people say, that doesn't make any sense to me. You you ask why, and you write right next to the sketch on the sketchboard what the problem is, or you sketch a new sketch, or you invite them to sketch a new sketch. And so it's it ends up being a facilitative tool for um, for uh, kind of advancing your ideas to the next level uh, out of the sketching phase. And and then what you would do after this would be then take the sketches that sort of seem like the most successful ones and um, take all those notes and uh, and then take them to higher fidelity design, whatever that is for you, whether that's um, you know HTML prototypes or, uh, or wireframes or, or something else. Um, it, this is a, pro a process that's very uh, amenable to lean and agile methodologies. And so what you can do if you're interested in sketching and sketchboarding is in this sort of one week chunk, you can focus on some specific user story or aspect of work. And then a structure that we've used in the past, I've used in the past that works well, is start start on Monday with just kind of a brain dump with the team about um, what are the uh, what are the requirements for this particular sort of unit of work? Start doing all that sketching on Monday afternoon, making sure you're doing lots of generative sketching. And then on Tuesday, you create a sketchboard. And by Tuesday afternoon, you're ready to review that sketchboard with the team and to do all those annotations and re-sketches together. By Wednesday, you can then turn those into slightly higher fidelity designs and then review with the team and refine further. By Friday, you've kind of really moved from back of the napkin sketching to um, a kind of a pretty big picture view of how to solve this particular portion of work. So that can work really well. So if you want to do a sketchboard, first step, sketch a lot, and then uh, compose it into a sketchboard that has some structure that matches what you're trying to solve. And have a review session, and then in that session, take a lot of notes. And, and that's the important part, notes and new sketches. So that's been a whirlwind of some methods. Um, I've got lots more that I want to share. But before I move on, I wanted to have a little bit of time in the middle just to stop and ask if there are any questions that are coming up or anything that I've uh, gone through quickly that you want a little more information about. Great. Uh, we do have quite a few questions so far. Cool. Um, Angelina here wants to know, I have a solid understanding of brand identity from the marketing end and a loose understanding of development, conceptual. If I'm looking to move my career toward UX, where do I start knowledge-wise and job-wise? Mm -hmm. Ah, that's a great question. Um, first of all, I would say uh, thank you, Angelina. We need you. More of you. I think actually the user experience field has uh, a little bit of a deficit in its understanding of brand. So I think people who have that blended perspective are really vital because I think that that's compre comprehensively brand plus product is is user experience. So um, that said, I, I think there really is no um, no replacement for actually just doing the work. So I would say. Uh, well, let me put it this way. I think actually there's two pieces of the work that you kind of need hands-on experience with if you want to start doing user experience design. The f and it's really simple. It's research and it's design. So getting um, some actual in-the-field practice uh, doing uh, kind of contextual observation of user needs uh, in relationship to the product is step one. Um, and I think that's an interesting um, uh, let's see, like maybe a, a different uh, approach than perhaps the brand and marketing community um, has. I know our brand and marketing community does a lot of user research too, but I think the, they're, they're, they probably 
um, have a deeper use of quantitative methods, and the user experience community has a lot of use of qualitative research methods. So I would say get some qualitative research experience as a starting point, and um, be looking for insights about real behaviors that customers exhibit in relationship to using the product, and um, specifically uh, any issues <laughs> they're having with the product needs, uh, and places where it's really falling down for them. And then um, start uh, start designing some solutions. And I think that can be as simple as you know mocking things up you know in, in PowerPoint or Keynote or sketching as we've just discussed. And then um, I think a very useful technique is testing those ideas again with those customers, taking them back and um, asking, okay, so let's say this is a screen or a, or a step or a document or a you know an app that you were presented with. What would you do first? And then what would you do next? And what would you do next? And so this this kind of sandwich of some upfront research, doing some design work, even if it's super low fidelity design work, and then testing it with users, is kind of the holy grail for the user experience process. And it's it's it sounds maybe a little daunting to jump right in if you haven't done it, but I think you you just learn so much just by by doing it and getting started. Um, so I would say those are some things that I would recommend. As a starting point, the other thing is there are so many really great courses available online now too that are for getting um, just lots of fundamentals kind of in place. Um, General Assembly has good stuff. I know Coursera has some good stuff. So I would say look online too for some just kind of UX 101 um, uh, kind of trainings that are out there. But again, I would I'd say that's not enough. So you kind of need to just like jump into the deep end and start doing doing some work. Excellent. We have another question here from Arnold. Okay. How does UXD differ from CXD? How do mm. you codify terminology and job titles slash roles? That's uh, that's a great question. Um, so UXD, just assuming I'm interpreting Arnold's cor cor question correctly, user experience design is UXD, and CXD is customer uh, ex uh, experience design. And uh, there's a pretty est established customer experience community that, out there that has a lot of um, a lot of kind of history in different businesses, and I think I always felt like they're pretty. There's a lot of overlap, but I, I've, I've had some, <laughs> I've been, I've gotten my hand slapped for saying that before. I think the customer experience community, to be honest, has done a lot more work looking truly at the end-to-end -end user experience, in, in, in terms of looking at um, all the different touch points that a customer has with a brand or a product, and also thinking a lot about. Um, uh, support and care as well as as aspects of that. I think user experience design as a community is trying to get to a place where they have that extremely broad perspective as well. And as they do, I think they'll get closer and closer to the customer experience community. But I think because UX has come out in some ways from the user interface um, discipline, uh, it's natural for UX folks to start by looking at the digital touch points only and not thinking about what's it like when you walk into a store, what's it like when you call someone on the phone and ask for support. Um, so I, that's, I think, one difference that I see. Um, I think the other difference is that the customer experience community actually has probably done a better job of figuring out how to quantify the cost and the value of of the different um, kind of touch points that it has with, the, with its customers. Um, and the UX community is still working on that. So um, I guess the, the short answer to summarize is I think the overlap is gray, and I think it's probably getting grayer as time goes on, but that there's, um, there's, there's a little bit of difference there. All right. Um, could you elaborate on how to plan a work session for clients or stakeholders or even in-house design teams? What are the goals and activities? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, that I think it depends a lot on what you're trying to accomplish with a work session. Um, I think the goal isn't necessarily. I think you, there's about a bazillion different flavors of a work session that you could have, and um, it really depends on where you are in the process. So whether you're trying to um, tee something up at the beginning in terms of creating shared vision versus whether you're trying to get the team to look at in-progress designs versus whether you're trying to get the team to review user research data and come together around shared insights, those would argue for very, very different um, techniques. And this this is a bit of a cop-out, so I apologize, but I think there's probably not time to go into detail on all of those things, but there are there are actually sort of details in, in the book about a lot of those different sort of flavors of sessions. Um, so I, 
I, I apologize, I'm not going to be able to answer that kind of more deeply here, but I would say check the book. And if I, I provide my email address at the end, so feel free to follow up with me personally by email if you want some more specific details. And if you do, for the person who asked that question, please um, just give me a little more information about what type of work sessions you're, you're trying to, um, to plan. Um, with that, I, I'm going to jump back into the next, the remaining slides because we've got a lot more to go in a short amount of time. Um, but, uh, but thank you for those great questions. Those are really interesting. Okay, so back into the kind of realm of, of lessons learned. Uh, the other observations from my, my journey as a UX team of one, number one, starting to get the opportunity to do internal user research uh, very early in my career where I was working on internal tools and being able to kind of um, spend some time just watching how uh, the people who use these tools were using them was really illuminating. You, people never do what you expect them to, and you don't, you just won't, don't know what they do until you actually really look and see for your for yourself. That was really important. And then also spending time starting to interview the, um, the kind of business decision makers that I work with to understand what value they thought the product had and the product design had. Um, those were those were really educational steps in the experience. And then when I started doing consulting work, I to further that, what I saw was that um, there's consultants themselves actually, because they have to scope their work, spend a lot of time up front actually trying to um, make sure there's a lot of clarity about what somebody's buying and what they're expecting from that. And so what we would do at Adaptive Path was we would write a sort of narrative of what the project was that we thought somebody wanted to you know, have with us and, and what those specific outcomes would be. And that those that then would form the basis of a statement of work. Um, that's a kind of just a classic consulting thing, but it actually, uh, if you think about it as something a user experience team of one does, this idea that you actually take time up front to articulate what is wrong, <laughs> what, what, what you're actually trying to help solve, and, and explain kind of what activities and outcomes you will contribute to the process to make that happen can actually really help people understand uh, what, you're, what you do and why they need it. And then also uh, getting actually into just beyond kind of internal user research, but getting into the field and actually observing how people work in their homes and their offices and the cafes and when they're buying things in stores. These were all really eye-opening experiences for me on my journey, which led me to the um, the the kind of the realization of the importance of just having a kind of very open listening beginner's mindset, not only with the customers that you're trying to design products for, but also with the teams and the, the sort of leaders that you're designing those products on behalf of. Um, so in terms of truly listening, uh, some just quick techniques for a team of one. Um, the listening tour, which uh, is used in a lot of different contexts in life, but here can be a really great way for you to just um, get to know the priorities of your cross-functional team and understand what they believe user experience design is and what they what they believe needs to happen um, as far as, uh, um, if anything, as far as more, more user-centered design approach in your organization. So certainly one-on-one -on -one discussions are a great way to, to tee that off, and they're also very good for relationship building. But even if um, even something as simple as just a survey <laughs> that you send out to you know your, your partners in your organization just to kind of summarize what do you think is is the most important part of our product? What what do you measure in terms of the success of our product? What parts do you think need improvement? What parts are great? These can be ways of just taking a quick pulse um, to try to under just just try to understand where people's minds are, uh, and that that can itself be extremely educational. So if you want to do a listening tour, uh, I think it's helpful just to start by figuring out like what are the questions that you you have where you know, and I think the UX questionnaire as a starting point, which we looked at before, can can tick that box for you. Uh, figure out who in your organization you want to chat with. And again, that kind of listing of the team members from the UX questionnaire can be good for that. And then just get listening and, and, and identifying those themes and figuring out kind of um, what that means as far as um, opportunities for improving the product, low-hanging fruit, opportunities for doing deeper research to understand more about your customers. And then I think another really important sort of um, method for UX teams of one is, in, in the truly listening realm is, is research, um, customer-focused, user-focused research. And I'm calling it guerrilla research here because, um, well, for this reason. It's actually extremely common, I think, to meet people who like the idea of user-centered design, who may even be doing some user experience design work, um, but they don't actually ever spend time with users. <laughs> and I, I think if you're not 
you can't call it user-centric design if you never meet or talk to a user. <laughs> and in fact, um, Jared Spool, who is uh, the, the man behind user interface engineering, a, a formidable um, uh, user research organization, has done um, some research and shown pretty demonstrably that teams um, who actually spend just uh, more time per month physically with users have uh, better products. So uh, if, you, if your team spends you know, two hours a month on average with your user, you'll have a better product than if your team spends you know, two hours a quarter. So this idea of Gorilla is to say, even if it's messy, even if it's, if it's just quick and dirty, um, some contact is better than no contact with your customers. Um, so to do that, uh, I think it's helpful to start by just asking yourself, what are the things that we need to know? What are the assumptions that we have about our, our customers and our users, and, and how how um, confident are we that those assumptions are right? And then the, that preliminary brainstorm, I think, will give you ideas for where to go and who to talk to and kind of get you out of the office. And getting out of the office is, is I think, the first step, uh, if, at least if that's where your users are. So simply just going to environments that your users might be likely to um, be located in is, is very helpful. If you're in the kind of um, business where your users are a very specific niche um, and, and it's just, you can't just walk into a cafe and there they are, I think um, a good starting point in that case is to talk to the people in your organization who do have direct access to your, your customers and your users, whether that's support or sales, um, and then um, either asking them to make an introduction, <laughs> or uh, asking them for insights that they have based on their interactions with your users can be a good starting point. Um, and then when you actually get into you know, the environment where you're sitting with your customers, it can be really um, great just to ask questions and to observe. That's, that's helpful. But I've actually found that inviting them to show their life to you and to make things together can actually lead to really interesting insights. So this is an example of um, a user research interview that I was in where we asked um, this particular user to do a, a journey line of his relationship with the product. Um, and a journey line is just, it's, it's a pretty simple concept. It's just sort of um, showing uh, from start to finish, sort of to the beginning to the end, the most emotional highs and lows that somebody um, kind of has had with a product. And, and so this is an example of um, just, uh, you know, okay, so at the beginning I'm pretty, it's neutral because we're just starting out, and then the sign-up process is a little crappy, and then I've gotten into this place and I'm happy, and, and then this is great and that's not great, and so on and so forth. And this kind of artifact can be really powerful back in your own organization for helping people understand um, the kind of what needs help, and because it comes from the user, not from you. Um, so that's very important. Um, this is another fun technique that I've used in the past. This is, I call this the design a superhero uh, template. Um, and the idea is if you're, if you're working on kind of um, the, more of a, a kind of green space project, thinking about, okay, what can we do that would really uh, solve some problems, new interesting problems for our customers, you give them this little blank template that sort of looks like a superhero, and you say, okay, let's say you, you know, you were making the superhero of X person is great at solving, you know, is solving the world's problems around X, um, what would that superhero have? Um, so this is a, this is a, this was an example of the superhero of travel, <laughs> where this superhero has um, the, the sort of uh, lots of interesting insights in their head about kind of maps and things like that, but they also have um, uh, kind of shoes that automatically change from good walking shoes to kind of uh, stylish street shoes to to have the blend and look like a local feature. Um, really easy packing, like the snap to grid suitcase to make it really easy to kind of get stuff in and out quickly. Like all these things that kind of speak to some of the more nuanced um, kind of human aspects of the of, of, of the experience of travel. And, and so there's something fun about techniques where you, you don't just focus on people's problems, but you ask them to kind of envision better experiences for themselves in a way. And that can, um, can lead to some really fun ahas, actually. So if you want to do guerrilla user research, you've got to think about who your target users are and how to access them, figure out what it is that you're kind of interested in digging into, and then to get into the field. And that's the most important thing is getting there and, and having those insights and bringing back artifacts from the field that you can share with the organization to share those insights with them. Um, another technique uh, that's great for UX teams of one, and call this a proto-persona. Um, personas are a very uh, common technique in the user experience field. They're basically, uh, a persona is a, um, 
a, a kind of a profile of, of, of a representative customer, not necessarily an actual person. In fact, it isn't an actual person. It's more like a composite of um, many people that you've observed through primary research, but it, it unpacks their kind of needs and motivations, um, the, their context and their sort of normal environment, and, um, and puts it in a picture that's sort of human and relatable. And the goal of this is to give you um, kind of representative people to, to keep in mind as you're designing, but also to help activate the sort of empathy part of the brain for your organization in, in, in remembering, oh, we're not just designing for a single white female, we're designing for a divorced mom of two who gets to go on one vacation a year and she's really um, excited because she wants her girls to have an amazing time. Um, so that's the idea of a persona. Um, a persona is uh, ideally informed by f primary research, which is to say field research that you've done firsthand, looking at actual people who are your customers or your target customers. Um, but if you don't have the resources to do that, to do that deep field research and to put together these big personas, um, you can make these sort of proto-personas, which are just really kind of messy DIY summaries of who you think your customers are. And um, it can be informed by whatever data you do happen to have access to. So you might have access to market segmentation data or some call um, kind of you know, summaries from, from customer support. And that stuff is good too, even if it's not primary um, kind of observable research. So the goal here is that you, um, with your team, you kind of get together and try to think about, well, who, who is probably this person that uh, we think we're designing for? And, and as you do with personas, try to think about them in a real way and try to think about kind of what 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 their real human objectives are. Um, and then the goal with all of that is to not just to like leave those on the shelf and assume that that's enough, but to seek ultimately down the road to validate those assumptions with real data. So if you want to do proto-personas, this can be a really great working session with your team to start to activate the empathy, the empathy neural pathways. Um, so you can bring a cross-functional team together, subdivide into smaller groups if there are a lot of you, and then for each sort of subgroup, ask them to put together a realistic picture of who, who you think your customer is that uses whatever data you have on hand, but also they have to bring that person to life. Um, and this can be a fun place to bring in, you know, pictures from old magazines and and uh, other kind of uh, really visceral sort of uh, stuff to put together into like a big poster picture of kind of this person's life, this person's context, this person's hobbies and values. Um, that can that can be really a uh, very fun opportunity for people. So those are some techniques for um, for uh, kind of truly listening, not just internally but also externally. Um, and those those three big secrets together, like uh, making things together, truly truly listening, and inviting people in, those felt like big big lessons for me as a UX team of one. And I felt like that alone was uh, not stuff that I would have known if I had you know at the very beginning of the process. But I reached eventually a point where I started to feel like I wasn't sure what else I was learning as a UX team of one. And um, in particular, I, I started to feel frustrated that there's a bigger, a bigger need to actually help the organization know where to kind of focus <laughs> to actually create great, really great user experiences. And that was where I felt like I wasn't necessarily getting a, kind of a lot of um, uh, new insight in my roles as a UX team of one. But where I, when I joined the consulting firm and I saw some of the kind of heavier weight stuff that they were doing, that was then I started to, some of these ideas started to click into place at a higher level around really helping an organization have a vision, have a strategy, and kind of know where they're headed. So um, user experience strategy, which is essentially helping to establish a kind of high-level vision and a roadmap for user experience, um, is was really eye-opening to me to kind of learn more about that and become better at that kind of the work. And then service design, too, which is... Um, uh, it's a, a field that we're learning more about in the U.S. So there's, I think, a, uh, a deeper practice around it in places like Northern Europe. But the idea that you're not just looking at the digital touch points, but you're looking at the overall um, um, set of products uh, and, that a, that, and, and touch points and, and services that a customer has in relationship to a, a kind of an overall brand or service, and that that is um, that, that can be optimized by looking at it from that more holistic perspective. Those, all those sort of um, ways of thinking about user experience helped me to see that you can actually, as a user experience professional, help the team prioritize, focus, and know where it's going to get kind of the biggest um, bang for its buck. And um, so some very lightweight methods to start to hint at that for UX teams of one. Um, one method which I 
would use actually in the context of a broader activity like say a strategy workshop um, would be uh, a prioritization poster. And the idea of a prioritization poster is it's just it's a tool for you to work with a team to discuss what you guys should do and what can be done, what can be done well, and what matters from a customer perspective. Um, and you can do it in a couple of different formats. Um, this is a, an example of a poster. Uh, the Bang versus Buck poster that one of my colleagues at Adaptive Path kind of uh, came up with. Um, the idea here is you you start at step one, where you basically, as a team, list all the features that you're considering um, adding, and then at step two, you plot those on um, what has uh, high bang or high impact, and what has high buck or high cost, and that's a way for you to identify things that would be really spectacular for the user experience, but that will be very hard for you to execute as an organization versus things that perhaps may be um, less high impact, uh, but also less effort, and just have a bit more of an informed conversation about what, um, where it really makes sense for you guys to invest your, your resources in terms of enhancing the user experience. Um, a different lens on that kind of prioritization is to use a Kano model chart. Um, the Kano model is, it's actually something that comes out of kind of product uh, product management uh, ethos uh, d d developed in the 80s by someone named Kano. Um, the idea of the Kano model is that you can basically s sort your features into um, into sort of features that are these kind of delight features or attributes, um, features that are uh, performance attributes, and and then features you consider to be basic attributes. And the basic idea of these is that basic attributes they're just they're table stakes. You have to have them in your product, but doing them really really superbly isn't going to make somebody love your product anymore. Um, versus performance attributes, which would be considered the um, the things that are you're kind of competing heavily within your space based on. So you kind of need to have those and. and it, having those will help the customer kind of value your experience. And then what we would consider delight attributes, which are things that nobody's expecting, but if you can do them really well, they just they make people love the product. And so this kind of way of plotting features can help you identify some things that, let's say basic attributes, you know you have to have them, but there's probably not, it wouldn't necessarily make sense to spend a lot of time perfecting them because you're not going to get any, more, any higher um, kind of love from customers for doing that versus delight attributes where maybe you don't need to do all of those things, but one or two done well can really kind of make the difference. And then performance attributes, which you kind of know you got to do. So that kind of facilitated um, prioritization uh, together can be very helpful when when uh, when you bring that uh, in your perspective as a as a kind of UX um, facilitator. If you want to do a prioritization poster, it's like many of these, you get the team together, you uh, think about the features that you want to consider, you plot each on an axis, and then you discuss. Um, I have exactly one more method, and then we'll be summarizing. So I'm going to go a little bit past the hour. If you have to leave, uh, thank you so much for joining. If you can stay for another 10 minutes or so, please do. Um, so last method, quick and dirty testing. Um, so. Uh, user experience design in a lot of ways grew out of um, kind of usability testing <laughs> of user interfaces, and so this doesn't seem perhaps on, on the face like a super strategic method, but I think actually testing out a product and, and, and helping to the organization to see with its own eyes how it fails customers or where it delights customers can actually be the most strategically impactful thing you can bring in. And it just it speaks words that, you know, no amount of talking uh, can can speak. So um, so for quick and dirty testing, it, it doesn't have to be hard. It can be as simple as bringing in a paper prototype and putting it in front of customers and taking them through in a kind of task-based way um, what the experience would be like and, and understanding from them what confuses them. Or there's a range of tools that are on the market that you can use for quickly testing out ideas even in a kind of remote setting. This is a um, a, a kind of diagram that was put together by the user experience design firm Clear Left. They're based in the UK. You can find this if you look on Flickr, actually. Um, and it's great. It's a kind of it helps you see the range of tools that are out there if you want to kind of quickly do some usability testing to help your organization see what matters. Um, so quick and dirty testing. The key is you know just quickly to find access to customers uh, and then um, observe if you can in a task-based way, which is to say. Don't ask them what they think, but ask them to do something, and then see, and then you know, in a somewhat unassisted manner, see if they can do that thing or how they misinterpret what they're trying to, you know, what the what the experience is capable of, um, and then you you know you repeat and iterate basically is the goal of that. Um, 
So those are some methods uh, f for uh, kind of influencing and, and helping organization focus. All this leads to my fifth and final sort of secret for the UX team of one, which is that this none of this is is high high style design craft. These are all about being smart, working with people, listening, being empathetic. And these are skills that are already in you, actually. So if you are um, you know, maybe in a related field but not doing user experience yet and you're interested in doing more, I would say um, you don't need to wait for permission. Your permission is already here. Please join us. We need you. We need your empathetic uh, kind of uh, abilities and we need your user-centered um, Compassion. <laughs> so join us. Um, and if you do feel like you need some extra tools in your kit, we've we've looked at a number of them in this uh, session today. We've gone through quite a few different recipes. So those are some interesting places where you might start. Um, and again, if you're interested in more of this, they, they go into deeper detail. And there are actually 27 methods in the book, The User Experience Team of One. Uh, so there's more there. Um, really quickly, I, I there's I borrowed heavily from, in particular, the website The Noun Project, which has just beautiful icons that are available for free. Um, so there's lots of attribute, lots of credit to be given to um, the sources of the visuals for this particular presentation. Um, I, I want to thank all of you guys for joining and for following along for an hour. If you are interested in chatting with me further, feel free to reach out to me. This is my email address, leahbuley at gmail.com. Um, and I'm on Twitter at uglia. And, uh, and we have time, I think, or well, we're a little bit over, but if you want to stick around, I will stick around too, and we can chat through some more questions. All right, so we do have quite a few questions here. Great, let's see here. Randall would like to know, how do you gain foothold in a project with managers that see UX work as only adding time to the project and not value? Yeah. Um, I think the key is to find some things that you can do um, quickly and in a lightweight fashion that don't actually require. Well, okay, let me let me backpedal here for a second. I think there's two things you can do. Um, the first thing I would say you could do is to actually just figure out what's something I could we could do in a day <laughs> or in you know in a in two days, and just to show that there is some new perspective that UX can bring in. I think sketching and sketchboards are actually a really interesting example of a technique that can be very eye-opening in that regard. I think going out and doing some quick guerrilla user research and sort of bringing those insights back can be valuable. I think the other thing that maybe I would recommend is actually sitting with a product manager or program manager and looking at what their calendar actually, what the, what the actual program plan is already, and then talking with them about where you would envision inserting UX into that process and how much time that would take. And often I think when you do that, when you kind of do that kind of comparison test of like this is what the what the what it is today versus this is what it would be with UX you see a couple of different things you see that um, adding UX doesn't necessarily re require adding a lot of time and that there are in, in fact some places where the, uh, you can kind of overlap it with other activities that are happening particularly if, if you're in um, an agile structure it's just a matter of adding UX as a couple sprint a sprint ahead I think um, the other thing that you, people see is that adding UX up front actually can diminish time later on, or diminish risk of time later on. Um, there's, a, there's a textbook which I, of course, am, am blanking on right now. But it's, it's cited in a couple of different online articles. But basically some, um, some research has been done to show that uh, money that you spend up front versus money that you would spend later on in the product development cycle to fix user experience problems increases inc incrementally. And specifically, for every dollar that you would spend in um, fixing or sort of putting, you know, putting the right thing in the, design, in the design phase, it costs $10 to fix it once it's actually in production, or once, it's, uh, once the code has been written, rather, and then $100 to fix it once it's actually in production. So the, this idea that um, you're investing a little bit of time up front, but to, to save uh, potential risk and time down the road, I think is, is a very important one. Um, if you want to learn more about that, um, there is a really fantastic YouTube um, video called The ROI of UX by Dr. Susan Weinschenk, uh, who, where she goes into that a little more. So I would check that out. But um, So yeah, I think it's a, it's a bit of both. It's on some level, it's like do a little bit of guerrilla work and show, the, show that it's not hard and show that it adds value. Um, do a little bit of sort of sitting together with the, the project plan and, sh and showing that that wouldn't, you know, that showing realistically what it actually takes to bring UX in, and then doing a little bit of speaking to the kind of 
rational numerate mind and helping people understand the potential savings, potential for savings that it brings. Excellent. Um, so Arnold would like to know, how do you present UX work in a portfolio? Um, what I've seen is I think it's very common to present UX work as sort of the story of um, the problem and then how it was solved. And you know, I guess I get, I get to see a lot of portfolios in, uh, into it because we have a large user experience community and I get to participate sometimes in the hiring process. And I think the most powerful portfolios that I see essentially set up the opportunity from a business point of view and explain kind of what you're trying to accomplish. They show the research that was done or at least summarize kind of um, summarize uh, where the, the insights come from. Uh, specifically the customer focused insights so what like wh why do we think we know what a customer needs and then they show the process a little bit they show the sketching that you went through they show the um, the kind of any kind of frameworks that you needed to do any kind of testing that you did and then they show a couple examples of kind of the moments of interest from the resulting user experience and I would say um, moments of interest means like what's you know the the, the heart of the of the product, the thing that sort of represents what made the concept really work, as opposed to kind of this is my 80-page wireframe deck. So I, I think you know if for showing that stuff from a portfolio perspective, the story the story matters almost more than the pictures. It's I don't think I mean I think showing a few little kind of screenshots or examples is really helpful, but actually being able to connect the dots for people on why um, customer-focused kind of insights led to a better user, better product that actually achieved business goals is, um, that's a very powerful story. All right, and Alberto would like to know, do you have trouble multiplexing between different clients experience, POV, or do you work on only one project at a time so you can live in it as much as possible? Mm, I These days I work on a couple projects at a time. Um, when I was at Adaptive Path, we only worked on one project at a time, and I would say that is absolutely the the optimal situation if you can do it. It's a luxury, I know, so many people maybe can't do it, but um, if you can, being really deeply embedded in that project and like actually moving your desk into the project room, which is what I would do in that situation, and um, be steeped in it all the time, it's just I think it leads it leads to a situation where you're thinking about the customer in a, in a deeper and different way. Um, that said, I think it's possible to do multiple multiple projects at the same time. I think it's good to kind of divide it up, though, so that you've got you know sort of a day for this and a day for that, or a half a day for this and a half a day for that. It's very, very hard to stay empathetic to a customer's point of view if you're jumping from project to project hour by hour. Um, and I would say, for me personally, at least, I don't know for everyone else, but I think more than two or three projects you just can't do well. So uh, certainly fewer would be better. And how soon in the process do you consider, let's see here, I think this says IXD or mm -hmm. as a part of the complete UX? Mm -hmm. um, so how soon would you consider interaction design as a part of the complete u user experience? Um, I think, if I understand that correctly, how, how early in the process should the interaction design kind of portion of the work get involved? Um, and just to clarify terminology here, so interaction design would is, is it focuses very specifically on the um, the design of the kind of how the how the person interacts with the product. So what the screens might look like and how they you know what they do in response to user behavior or what the different touch point you know, if it's a physical touch point, what the brochure looks like or what the kiosk looks like or something like that. Um, but it's it's that more detailed kind of working on the, the actual nuances of that, what happens when you press this button, what happens when you open this you know, door. Um, and I would say that it's really good for the interaction design, people who are responsible for interaction design, to be involved in the process early on just so they understand and can contribute to um, the discussion. Um, the reason I'm pausing a little bit, I had a really interesting conversation just last week with somebody actually where they were 
this is a program manager actually, but anyway, she was saying, you know, it, I, of course, ideally everybody should be involved at the pro, in the process at the beginning. Everybody should do it. You know, like interaction design should be there, visual design should be there, research should be there, content strategy should be there, QA, engineering, certainly, you know, pro, program and product management. But that's like eight people, and if you have eight people full time at the beginning of a project, that's that's an incredibly costly proposition to an organization. So. I take that. I think that's uh, we need to be mindful of that. So what I would say is um, we need to find really good um, high value uh, kind of moments or milestones early and then periodically throughout the project that brings everybody together. So a really powerful kickoff work session will will um, bring you all together and have, and have shared vision uh, for you know to get you through a certain period of time and then uh, in a way that you know um, enables you to use that time efficiently, but then not necessarily have to be kind of in the same project room together for the next month or something. Um, so uh, I don't know if I've fully answered that question, but that's my thought is um, early <laughs> in the beginning, but in, a, in very targeted ways if possible. All right, and so we do have quite a few more questions, and I just wanted to check in with you. Um, how many more are you willing to take? I did. Let's let's do about two more, and then um, it, it, people have my contact information, so everyone should feel free to follow up with me online after or after okay. uh, offline afterwards if they'd like to. That sounds great. Cool. Um, so I'll go ahead and ask a question from Esteban. What kind of backgrounds or roles do people in the UX team have? Example: content strategists, designers, or developers. Mm -hmm. Yes. The answer is all of the above. <laughs> uh, user experience is um, a really interesting field right now because it's relatively new. I, I would say you know it's um, it's maybe been around for kind of 20 or 30 years, but really has only become ex very mainstream in probably the last decade or so. So it's pretty customary to meet people who do user experience work who started out as a content strategist or as a technical writer or doing project management. Um, now, increasingly, there, I think, are more formal design education programs for user experience. So we'll, be, I think, be seeing more people who are just kind of classically trained in user experience. But um, I think uh, any of those perspectives where you thought about how somebody needs to consume information um, in one form or another is good training. I actually met a user experience team of one who started out as a general contractor for building people's homes. Um, and she said that being in a situation where she had to think about how far to make the, you know, the electrical outlet from the sink, you know, got her thinking about user experience and, and, and people's needs and capabilities. And I think that's, that's really the most important thing is that you have a kind of practice where you're, you're able to, um, to envision how people would, sort of interact with a product or an experience from the other side, you know, from their perspective, um, that that alone I think is is sort of one of the most fundamental um, requirements for doing this kind of work. But, um, but yeah, absolutely, I think um, the most obvious candidates for kind of being a good user experience designer or you know, um, most obvious background include um, graphic or visual design, um, information architecture, taxonomy work, uh, content, uh, any kind of content writing, being a copywriter or a journalist or a technical writer, any kind of engineering, particularly people who've done a lot of front end or web development. Um, uh, QA, I think, also can be a really good um, starting point for that. And then I think pro program management, uh, I think program managers, I often meet the program managers who've actually been doing wireframe design <laughs> without realizing it. So um, I think that's a good one too. All right, so last question here. Yeah. As a UX team of one, a UX designer can get overwhelmed with so many project and needs, projects and needs. How does she prioritize her projects and when? Any tactics to push back and say no? Mm. This is, I think, um, a place where if you're clever, you can actually use your team to help you do that prioritization. Um, so rather than simply pushing back, I, I think doing the kind of workshop where you are maybe doing a UX health check or where you're doing um, poten potentially kind of like a, an opportunity workshop or maybe a heuristic kind of um, analysis would be a way to ha invite the team to actually help you identify what has the highest impact 
and what's the most important stuff to focus on first. Um, and that's not to say that you couldn't figure that out yourself, obviously. I mean, I, I, I think step one is figure out what you think is at the highest impact to your organization. And if you don't know the answer to that, I'd say you need to find, spend a little more time um, digging into your business needs and also digging into user research. But if you do have a point of view on what the most important stuff is, then I think um, it can be very um, good relationship building to actually turn that into a conversation with the cross-functional team and to help them see the range of stuff that could be fixed. Um, you invite them in maybe to a meeting where you show uh, you know all the kind of parts of the product that are broken right now, or things that are that are in progress, and then and then take them through an activity kind of where you prioritize kind of what what needs to come first. Um, and we talked about a couple different ways of prioritizing, I think, in this session. And then you know discuss maybe if their their point of view is different than yours, but then at least it's not you sort of pushing back. Um, I think one thing that I see a lot with UX teams of one is that you can get so um, kind of overburdened and from a resource perspective, and I think also kind of defensive because you're trying to help everybody understand that this is important, but they don't necessarily always understand that it can put you in a kind of defensive stance in relationship to your team or your organization, and that's not good for you or good for the product. So um, finding a way to make it a, um, a, a that to a process that you invite them into, uh, I think can um, and just uh, kind of turn turn the nature of the relationship around if that's an issue. Um, so that's what I would recommend. Excellent. Well, I'd just like to say what a fantastic presentation and well received by the audience. Yay. Um, thank you all for joining us today. And Leah, is there anything else you'd like to leave everybody with before you take off? I, I just want to thank you all for joining. I'm I'm so excited that there was a good um big good community of us today. I just think you I think you guys UX teams of ones are doing the most important work in our in our field today because you guys are bringing user centered design to places where it has never been before. And as the more we have technology in our lives, the more we need better user experience. So go forth and conquer. You have the tools. All right. Thanks, Thanks again, everybody. Leah. And just a reminder to you all, we will have this archive available within 48 hours um, at the same information page on O'Reilly's website that Leah had her webcast on. So um, I just pushed that link out. And we also pushed out a little discount for her book, um, which I'll do again in just a moment. And um, that's it. Have a great morning, afternoon, and night to for wherever you're from, and thanks again, Leah. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye.